Play mode. Hi there, everybody. We are uh, getting ready to start our webinar. We have a full house today, and I'm going to give everybody a few more minutes to uh, to sign on. Sometimes GoToWebinar can be a little bit challenging. Today, you are joining the Marketing Wines by the Glass to Women, sponsored by Napa Technology. And um, we will get started. I see people are arriving, are continuing to arrive, so we'll give a few minutes. You can also um, ask questions. There's a question uh, little box down on the right-hand side of your your um, panel, and I will be able to see those questions. So, um, and we'll take those questions all at the end. If there's anything that we can't answer or any data that um, you would like returned or you want to know more about, just let me know. We'll also have all of our contact information on there so that you can, uh, you can get it. So I think we're gonna get started. Um, again, this is Marketing Wines by the Glass to Women. Uh, Napa Technology is our sponsor today, and they are the designers and manufacturers of the Wine Station. The Wine Station was named by Entrepreneur Magazine as one of the year's most innovative products. If you haven't checked it out, you should definitely do so. It's a really nifty, nifty uh, machine. And uh, you can see them at napatechnology.com. They are in restaurants and wine bars and grocery stores, even on cruise lines. So webinar information. Um, in order to get the most out of your webinar, you want to close down any other programs. The webinar can be, or not not the webinar, but go to webinar can take up a lot of uh thinking on your computer so sometimes it's better if it's uh those other things are turned off but it it should be it should work just fine anyway it's being recorded um at the end of this we need about 72 hours in order to get that recording back up and we'll send that out to everybody with the deck if you're having technical or audio problems the uh, support at Citrix Online is great, and they have a uh, a pretty a pretty good and fast way to solve any of those issues. The runtime is about forty to forty five minutes, and then we're going to leave fifteen to twenty minutes at the end for Q and A. The way to ask a question is you'll see in the bottom right of your screen, there's a question box um, and you can just type it in there. I'll be able to see it and um, we can hopefully get to everybody's questions. If we don't or if we don't have the answer to your question, I will try and get to it after the webinar. If no one on the webinar can answer it, I'll find somebody for you who can. Um, if you're tweeting, the Twitter handle is wine to women A great way after all the webinars, I love to go back, run that hand or run that uh, hashtag, and then find all the data because it's a good way to kind of fill in my notes at the end. Um, and again, you know, you don't need to do that because we are going to be sending the deck out to you. Your panelists, we have Deborah Brenner and Marion Jansen Optahar. They both have years and years of experience in the wine industry. And one of the things that I find really compelling about both of them is not just their experience marketing wine to women, which you can see is extensive, but also that they had these, these other careers prior to to. Uh, working in the wine industry. And like most of us, they're really passionate about wine and that's what brought them to the wine industry. Um, Deborah heads up Women of the Vine and she is was instrumental in creating the more uncorked, uh, the wine gr uh, not wine group, the um, <laughs> the uh, Wine Club for Women for More magazine. Sorry about that. 
And Marion, I've worked with Marion for years, and she is probably best known for developing the Fleming's 100. It is the award-winning Wines by the Glass program for Fleming's Prime Steak and Wine Bar, and that was created specifically to uh, attract women diners. Um, your host is Jane Portnoy. She's the VP of Marketing and Strategy for Napa Technology, and she has a ton of wine marketing experience in addition to being with Napa, um, and she is also uh, responsible for putting, putting this whole thing together. I am your moderator, and any questions, issues, whatnot that you may have after the webinar, um, go ahead and shoot me an email. All of our emails and contact information will be on the last slide. Um, just shoot it over to me and I will uh, try and find someone to help you. All right, so we're going to talk about why women are important to wine sales and I'm going to let Jane take over from this point. Karen. All right, so let's talk about this group of women and why they're so important to our industry today. Um, the median income for women today is between $39,000 and $68,000, depending on the level of education. Why this is so important is not only are women today living longer, but they're also spending longer periods of time without kids, which means they have far more disposable income and they are becoming a very significant buying force especially in the restaurant and hospitality industries. What we're seeing today is that restaurant, um, inside restaurants, alcohol servings to women have increased by 14% in the last three years, while decreasing for men. What's interesting about this is it's not an immediate trend or something that was driven by economy, but something that has been happening for over the last 20 years, according to the LA Times. Women also have massive potential. A recent Nielsen data poll estimated that women will continue to control nearly two-thirds of all consumer resources in the U.S. over the next decade. So clearly this is a huge environment and a very powerful demographic we don't want to overlook. Women will also be the beneficiaries of the largest transference of wealth in this country's history. Part of that is due to the fact that women boomers are lasting longer and they're inheriting not just from their parents, but also from their husbands. In addition, women make up to 70% of the purchases in all retail environments. In addition to that, outside of retail, as it applies to restaurants, they make up 57% of wine purchases on premise. So whether it's in a restaurant or in retail environments, women are purchasing wine and lots of it. So if they're not your priority audience yet, they definitely should be. We're also very powerful buyers. Women head up 72% of U.S. households and make the purchasing decisions for the majority of all consumer goods, ranging from apparel, groceries, and everyday items. What this means is we account for 12 of the $18 trillion of annual consumer spending. That is a lot of money. Women also have resources, control, and motivation. So when you combine dual household incomes, you're looking at spending power of nearly $92,000. So to marginalize this group is a huge loss to profitability. Um, from here, I'd like to turn it over to Marianne to talk a little bit about um, and delve a little deeper into female drinking habits. Hey, Marianne. I think she has a, there you go. You're back. I had some technical difficulties. I'm <laughs> sorry. Okay. I'm going to, uh, women drink more wine than men. We all know that. Um, 150 of the 228 million Americans of legal drinking age enjoy an adult beverage. Uh, and 100 million of those choose wine. Um, leaving the total for beer and spirits at 50 million. Um, up to 100 million who choose wine, 51 million are women and that percentage is on the rise. So actually it means that 35% of legal age Americans don't drink. So there's a, a, a huge opportunity there as well. Um, overall, men and women are drinking more frequently and men are responsible for 80% of beer consumption, while women drink more than 20% more wine. Um, 
about core wine drinkers. Um, core wine drinkers drink at least a glass of wine a week. Um, by the way, a glass of wine per week actually means about 10 bottles of wine a year. Uh, and in 2012, Americans drank an average of 14 bottles of wine a year. So there has to be a more hardcore wine drinker as well, I would say. Um, and just for comparison, Italians drink 50 bottles of wine a year. So uh, we have a, a way to go there too. Uh, the core has nearly doubled since 1970. Um, at which time, actually, Americans drank about five bottles of wine a year. 10% uh, more women than men are responsible for the shift to core wine drinkers. Uh, women at the center. Um, the roughly 10% margin between male and female wine enthusiasts seems narrow, but it's actually largely due to age. Uh, Gallup research indicates that men's interest in wine is equivalent to women's at ages above 50, uh, but today younger men have less interest in wine than women their age. So uh, among millennials, millennials are anybody 30 or younger, so 21 to 30 in wine drinkers. Among millennials, women dominate the wine scene by well over 10%, as men stick primarily to beer. Uh, as younger generations age, women will account for a larger percent of these core wine drinkers uh, and be uniquely important to wine sales. Yeah, that's only going to grow, of course. So I have a, I have a question for you, Marion. Um, in your work with Flemings, were you, I think you were there for about 10 years. Yes. Um, were you seeing an increase in women on the floor drinking wine? Customers? Yeah, over that 10-year yeah. period. Um, well, we always had a good share of, of, of women customers at Fleming's. Right. Uh, remember, it was sort of designed for that. Right. Uh, the interior was a little friendlier to women, and and certainly uh, having so many wines, which is an issue we're, we're going to address later, I think. Yeah. You know, just have the variety of wine, uh, 100 wines by the glass. Right. Um, really made to make a difference. So yeah, there's always been a lot of women in Fleming's. Great. Ms. Karen, I think to your point, it's a huge testament that one of the largest restaurant concepts in the country developed an entire steak concept around the female environment. I mean, there is no question that Fleming's developed their platform knowing that this base of consumer was driving the purchasing decision and also growing. Right. So it wasn't a steakhouse that tried to lighten things up for women. It was a steakhouse that designed itself for women. Great point. Um, mm -hmm. So, f you know, for most most folks, like, this seems obvious that we need to attract more women. Um, but when we, when Napa Technology did a survey, only 33% of restaurants had created programs to attract female wine drinkers, which seems fairly low to me. Um, we know that women choose wine for different reasons than men. And uh, although women travel in packs, they're very individual. They like to make individual purchases. And we're going to talk, we're going to give it to, uh, I think, Jane, this is your next section. Yes. Yeah what women want and how to attract them. That almost seems like a dating seminar. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why we are here today. Um, what we try to do in narrowing the scope of some of the issues, as Karen just stated, these were sort of the three key elements that rose to the top in our research. For the last four years, we've been doing some extensive research in both on and off-premise environments. Uh, it was no surprise last year that we saw millennials take the big surge, but in our research in the last few years, we saw females is really starting to creep up and make more noise in this space. So I wanted to give you some dial down into that psyche so you can understand some takeaways for today. What is interesting to understand, especially as it uh, participates to wine by the glass offerings, is that the first and most critical reason that people are choosing wines by the glass, and this is the same for men and women, is that they're looking for perceived value. 
women specifically are willing to pay more for a premium glass of unfamiliar wine or wines by a glass in a whole. So what we're seeing is the universe as a whole is splurging in smaller portions. So the wines by the glass environment is growing extensively. But what's really unique to women is that they're more willing to explore. They have a huge sense of adventure, but they're also conscientious. What we also saw really take root in the last two years was the advent of the half glass offering. Uh, we saw in a piece of research last year that 47% of sales they saw a 47% sales increase when they added a half glass option. So women are more willing to drink a little bit more, just in smaller doses, but they're willing to explore and try a lot of different things. What's also interesting is that women are willing to ask questions and get opinions more than men. So if anyone's ever driven with their husband or a mate in a car, you know this to be 100% true. But what's really nice to understand as an operator is that women are making their purchases very similar to all the other purchases they make in their life. They ask for opinions, they like suggestions, and they will follow the lead of their peers and mates. So variety seems to be the spice of their life. Really having a lot of options to choose from is what women are gravitating towards. Uh, in our survey, uh, in addition to perceived values being the number one, the second was the opportunity to taste a variety of wines. We believe this goes in tandem to people have more opportunity today to educate themselves, whether it's online, they're dining out more, they have access to it, we share, we Twitter, we tweet, but people are far more educated today about their wine consumption, and so now they're more anxious and desirable to try more things, especially the millennials. Um, with approximately half of weekly meals being eaten outside the home, and that's a lot, women have more opportunities now than ever to sample new wines. So what they're sampling on-premise, they're taking and buying off-premise. So there is some synergy here. So how do wine drinkers decide what to drink? Um, what we are seeing is that as Wines by the Glass programs become far more sophisticated, and this is happening outside of fine dining environments. We're seeing it take root in casual dining environments, and it's starting to trickle down into more quick casual environments as well. You'll see it actually even Chipotle is adding wine, beer, and margaritas to their menu in 2014. So what that does is it puts an increasing burden on bartenders and servers to really have a strong knowledge of the wines they're serving. So they not only need to know what the wine menu is, but to have some good, solid understanding of what the wines are, where they come from, and what they taste like. Also, what we have found is that traditionally wine companies place a lot of emphasis on wine scores and reviews, but that seems to appeal far more to men when they're making their decisions than to women. They place a little bit of less weight or importance on scores and concentrate more on personal experience or trusted advice from peers. Women are also not bashful about what is she having and often take suggestive cues from friends and family. So it's very important to create a network within this environment because they will all drink what others are drinking. I also want to talk a little bit about one glass at a time, and this goes back to the phenomena that we're seeing in terms of the real importance of wine by the glass offerings. Beer has always been leveraged uh, by beer companies for their convenience of single-serve packaging. Um, for anyone that's been watching the news in the last few days, even Budweiser just changed the shape of their can to further claim the importance of the single-serve. With more and more women drinking wine versus beer, it is going to place far more significance on wine by the glass options and making them more accessible because that environment is looking to buy by the glass. What, we know that wines are difficult to manage. They spoil very quickly. But in the last five years, preservation technology has trained, changed dramatically um, with options now where you can actually have preservation for nearly as long as 60 days, also introducing temperature control portion controls, it's changing the scope of not only what we're able to serve, what guests are able to experience, and for the first time, many guests are actually tasting wine the way it should be. And then finally, uh, preservation and knowledge really need to go hand in hand. 
What we learned last year in a piece of our survey was that 57% of consumers believe that they can identify oxidized wine. That is a scary number. Even if they don't know what oxidized wine tastes like, they think they do, which puts a lot of onus on restaurateurs, operators, and their staff to actually know what properly tasting wine is and how to best serve it at the right temps so that you're getting the best possible experience out to your guests one glass at a time. Now you can change the slide, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I got excited. <laughs> no worries. So how do you get the message right? I'm going to now turn it over to the expert, to Deborah, to dive a little bit further into that female psyche. Thanks, Jane. Um, I mean, this slide is, is meant to uh, really bring out the stereotypes about what a lot of people think about women. Uh, we're seeing this also in the trends of, um, of some of the big uh, corporate companies that are producing wine. You're seeing, you know, some of these gimmicky labels, some labels coming out, low calorie wines are really big right now. Because again, you know, there are always some truth to stereotypes, but again, we just want to point out that, that that is not necessarily, you know, the dominating uh, group of, of the audience, especially coming on and off premise. Um, you know, the stereotypes of women uh, don't drink red wine, that they're only drinking white wines or, or you know, sparkling or, or something uh, besides that red is just you know, out of their realm, they don't like it. Um, and the stereotype of women eating small salads, and we're seeing that, you know, that uh, that women should only eat small plates, and, and that's obviously a big uh, misnomer as well. Um, the stereotype that women don't know anything about wine, uh, we see that a lot with the marketing going on uh, in the big box stores, as you see, because uh, as we say, they're kind of dumbing it down uh, for women and, uh, and using lots of gimmicky terms and, and gimmicky language to, um, to think that women don't know how to make a, a wise decision on wine. Some of the other stereotypes is that women only like sweet wine. Uh, again, we are seeing a, a surge in Moscato, but um, that's only one small demographic of, of your wine consumer. Uh, women uh, only love uh, pink. And uh, we put here that women don't like sports because, again, we see a lot of uh, sports-themed on-premise, um, you know, restaurants and bars that forget that there is a huge demographic for women. And actually, uh, one of the, you know, um, largest demographics, believe it or not, uh, for drinking wine and, and watching uh, sports right now is NASCAR. And... Um, when we're seeing the resurgence of, of women attending football games, over 300,000 women are actually attending football games um, during the season. And also 50% uh, of all the people attending baseball games are women. So that is a real big opportunity for people to look at being able to target the woman audience. And the uh, other stereotype, because we're seeing all of the uh, drinks coming out low calorie, skinny margarita, skinny wines, you know, Bethany Frankel putting all of that out, is um, the tendency to think that that's all that women are, are seeking out of their wine consumption. I think some of the other, you know, stereotypes that we want to just, you know, point out because obviously when we when we recognize them we hope that we can then uh, change them is uh, the wine industry has often you know generalized and, and stereotyped what women have and again we see that with the trends of all of these uh, gimmicky marketing labels that are out there um, let me point out that like any stereotype it's only to a small group and you do see many of those labels being what we call one-hit wonders. They kind of come and go off the shelf, but they don't have the longevity. Um, they also only appeal to, to a very small demographic. Um, also, wine marketers in the industry, they often, you know, put one stereotype of, you know, the suburban housewife, the soccer mom, you know, taxing around the kids all day, and then, um, substitute it with the other stereotype, which is, you know, the, the super mom who can do it all, juggling, you know, her top job, CEO, and, uh, and also juggling all the kids and, and doing it seamlessly. Um, 
And then uh, the other stereotype is to make a real connection with women wine drinkers. Um, the labels in the restaurants need to be more personal and individualized with their recommendations, um, really being able to talk better uh, to these women and not talking down to them. Um, as, as many of us know, just, uh, you know, you see girls' night out, you see certain nights of the week where there's tables just filled with all women. Um, women tend to congregate uh, with, with others like them. Uh, we see that not only in restaurants, but we see that also in clubs, in, in book clubs, and other things, in groups and gatherings that women are so much involved in. Uh, they trust and actively seek out their friends uh, for wine recommendations. And we should point out that, you know, women do um, basically uh, trust and actively seek out recommendations from other women. Uh, we saw the incredible popularity of, like, Angie's List. And I think that's a true testament of how women do trust uh, the other women for, for recommendations. Um, uh, the community provides plenty of opportunities uh, for both digital sharing and community events, and we're going to talk a little bit about that afterwards of how we can use social media and, and do that. Tasting events are definitely a great opportunity and an obvious choice for you to promote your buy-the-glass offerings. Again, if you want to spice um, you know, it up, you can do some blind tastings, but that's not even necessary because they want to be educated, not necessarily feel that they're being intimidated. They want to demystify it. So I'm also a big one of not doing a lot of blind tastings because sometimes that gets people nervous and a little bit, you know, they shy away because they think that they're going to look foolish or not be able to identify. But you can have fun with both of it. Um, but the great thing about tastings is to go ahead and give uh, women an opportunity with their friends to share in a common experience. And these events can be tailored around specific regions or specific varietals. So you could go ahead and choose, let's do a Spanish tasting this one, let's do an Italian tasting, a French, California wines, maybe wines, you know, from the East Coast with, you know, the Finger Lakes. And it just goes on and on. And, um, and people just really enjoy uh, being able to uh, learn more about it and try those wines. I think here, um, empowered and not cutesy is really something for me. Um, anybody that may know about Women of the Vine and what we've been doing, uh, this this really is, is, you know, I love the title here because that's what we're all, all about. It's about educating women. Um, women are really concerned um, with more than the brands that give them credit for. And the brands really need to understand how women connect with them. Many brands, as you see in the wine business right now, and I talked about it before with the gimmicky labels, they're using babies, they're using the critter labels, the animals, definitely lots of pink. And they're trying to attract the women buyers, um, thinking that that's really, you know, uh, how women are making their selection. You know, those are fun. They're fun to give to your girlfriend. They're fun to show up at a book club. And, um, you know, but again, they tend to not be reorders and not something that people are doing all of the time, which many of you out there may, may already know from wine labels you see. And they definitely can backfire when you have not just an affluent, but we really need to say just a savvy uh, woman out there uh, a woman who, um, you know, doesn't need to be played down to, and it can backfire where they actually take offense to that. Um, providing real information in a very straightforward way um, and informing your audience is really the best way to connect with these women. And then um, keeping it real and accessible, again, um, women want to know. They're very, very curious. They want to understand it. And um, as we said earlier, they're not afraid to ask, and they want to touch and feel and try. So women really want information. They want to communicate, and they want to understand. Um, providing wine education helps them uh, make an informed decision, and that means not just providing the wine education for 
the your woman uh, consumer coming into your retail store or your on-premise, but also making sure that your staff is educated so that your staff can help the uh, woman wine drinker make that decision. Um, the wine-centric snobbiness uh, as far as, you know, all of this very, um, you know, mysterious language that was used to intimidate people, um, that has been basically uh, thrown out the window and, and, as we say, vetoed by women. Uh, women don't buy into that. They want to have some real descriptions. And I think we're seeing, like we said, with the millennials and also women being very adventurous, that um, the mystery of all of that is, is gone and, and they, they don't really um, take too kindly for people to make them feel intimidated by making a wine choice. And women, um, accessibility is important from pricing, variety, and, and an attitude um, perspective. So I think it's very important for, for the GLASS program to have lots of variety and price points to give women a lot of choices based on where they stand on their wine education and what they're willing to explore. Um, I think that's mine, Deb. That's just, yes, it is. Exactly. That's why I'm, <laughs> I'm going to throw this one to Marion. I think it went over one slide, didn't I? I yeah, that's okay. You did real well. Um, <laughs> um, women are tactile, so appeal to their desire to try it on by providing female-friendly wine flights. Yeah, I, I, I think that's such an important thing. Uh, wine flights and samples, both. Um, I think a flight is a mini seminar, I always call it, and um, you know, you can pair it up by varietal, you can pair it up by region, and you know, you instantly learn something, and you learn what you really like, and I think women really like that, um, and then they, they often want to talk about it, I think, to other women, so uh, it serves um, two purposes there, um, they educate themselves, and and they'll they'll start talking to other other women about it. There was a study out there that uh, that women speak up to twenty thousand words a day, and men seven thousand words. Wow! Um, now we know the problem. Yes. Yeah, so, and I, I I think those those extra thirteen thousand words are usually uh, we usually uh, talk to other women uh, with those words. So uh, there's a lot of communication going on between women. Uh, rather than ratings, like we're saying, um, you know, they, they talk to other women about what they drink and what they like. So flights educate not just them, but, but everybody around them, too. Um, flights provide... Oh, sorry. Gonna, sorry about yeah, that. No, no, I was going to say it's, it's <laughs> risk-free uh, sampling. I think it's also less of an investment of money, obviously, uh, trying out things. And... At Fleming's, I remember telling people just to, because all the 100 wines were by the taste as well, um, to come in and just taste wine and use it as an education for your retail shopping. Sure. Um, because, you, you know, it, it's, it, you know how you buy a bottle of wine and, and it wasn't anywhere near as good as you thought it was going to be. And, you know, it might not be an expensive bottle of wine, but it's still maybe $15 that you wasted. So sampling is is a great way of doing doing it in restaurants, but then using that information uh, in a retail setting. Uh, so I think that's that's another uh, a real advantage of flights and samples. And Marion, at Fleming's, what did you consider a taste? Was that like a one ounce pour, two ounces roughly? Well, at Fleming's it was two ounces, but okay. you know, I think one ounce is, is a good taste too. You you actually need about three quarters of an ounce to really taste the wine. Okay. And uh, so one ounce would work as well. Okay, perfect. Thanks. And here to that point, um, Napa Technology has seen a tremendous surge in on prem or off premise retail environments, ranging from large liquor chains like ABC, Fine Wine and Spirits in Florida, all the way to major grocers like ATV, Hy-Vee, Kroger, Whole Foods, uh, Harris Teeter throughout the country where they're putting wine station equipment in the aisles to offer one ounce tastes to encourage shoppers to explore wines they may not have. 
and what we're seeing is there is a 30% uptick in the price of bottles wine will choose. So that one little ounce, uh, don't be bashful about giving away one ounce because it's going to absolutely generate into more long-term sales. Which is a pretty amazing stat. So thanks for thanks for sharing that. I think that's incredible. Absolutely. And I, I mean, just, just, you know, adding one thing on that point, uh, uh, talking about women being, you know, wanting to touch and feel and to try it on, as we say, um, you know, they've taken out all of that guesswork by being able to get that one ounce pour. You're really letting somebody go home and, and be satisfied. So not only are you seeing an uptick in sales, but you're also seeing a much more satisfied customer, which I think everybody from whether on premise or off premise, that's our ultimate goal is whether somebody comes in and they ask someone like Marion as a sommelier or they ask your, your, you know, wine person behind the, the uh, counter or in the aisle of the store, if you could guide them towards the right wine. The best thing you want to do, whether it's a $10 bottle of wine or a $40 bottle of wine, you want them to go home and be very happy and be satisfied or happy at the table. And I think taking that one ounce pour and being able, um, you're, you're really getting a, a much better customer satisfaction and an uptick in sales. So they'll just keep coming back. That's a great point. All right. So where do we find these women? Again, this goes back to sounding like our dating site. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so um, where where do we find them? Well, Marion, I love the statistic that you just said. So you have to email that to me because I'm going to use that in some of my things in the future because I think that's really incredible. Uh, many times when I talk to people and go out, I always joke about how, um, you know, uh, women, you know, invented the original social media. They didn't need uh, <laughs> Facebook or anything else. Women have been word of mouth marketers since the beginning of time. And, um, and I think that, you know, you're seeing that where, um, you know, social media channels, um, they're integrated into uh, the daily routine of millennials and, and all generations we're seeing. I mean, I love to see, you know, um, you know, you know, moms out there from all ages and actually my mom in her 70s texting, you know, her grandchildren and it's just <laughs> phenomenal. I love it. So, um, you know, as I said, women have, have really been the pioneers for uh, word of mouth marketing. What we've done today is given them incredible, very fast and easy tools to allow them uh, to communicate without having to pick up a phone and hope that somebody is actually physically home in the house. Um, for anybody who's my age can actually remember those days. <laughs> you had to actually hope somebody was home and answer the phone compared to today. Um, I think the social is so, so important here. Um, let's, let's not forget wine is social. I mean, that is the core of wine. Um, yes, you can drink it um, on your own, uh, but certainly uh, we, you know, majority of us feel that wine is best enjoyed when it's with friends, when it's with food, and when it's with conversation. And, um, and also selling wine and selling your wine store or your, your wine uh, program on premise is also social. So it's really important. Uh, utilize uh, your website. Utilize other websites and Facebook um, pages can showcase your wine program and offerings. Um, don't be shy about offering female-friendly suggestions. Uh, we do see um, an, an uptick in, in um, sales when uh, restaurants uh, actually give pairing suggestions on the wine list for certain foods. It's a great thing to try, like even if you just want to try it for some of your specials so that you don't have to, you can change your specials, let's say weekly, and maybe change out some of your wine pairing suggestions. But that is a great way um, to offer. And, and then you're also putting something fresh and something new on your Facebook page on a regular basis. Um, I think the important thing here uh, is, you know, make your Somalia your wine director, you know, like uh, Marion's whole career, you know, make them a focal point. Um, definitely 
um, demystify them um, by showcasing who they are. Uh, you know, women definitely connect uh, by stories and by other women and, um, and also just by the people that they're being educated by. Everybody wants to know uh, who is actually guiding them in their choices. So to be able to put on your Twitter or your Facebook or your, or your website who your wine director are, then people can make a connection with them. Um, give them a voice and um, and let them respond and and also um, communicate with with your uh, customers because that will give people much more trust and the two way conversation that social media allows brands to capture the data um, what you're going to get and understand from your particular community and the females that frequent in your particular, whether it's a sports bar or it's an upscale steakhouse or it's your, you know, um, local wine shop, everybody's going to have different data that they're going to capture. And that two-way conversation is critical for you to see what their interests are. And I think Perfect. here... I um, am to throw this to Marion. That's right. Um, <laughs> educated wine drinkers. Well, certainly I think we all know that wine drinkers are much more educated now than uh, at any other time. What Jane said about 57% thinking they can spot oxidized wine, I think that's even low. I think people really do know when a wine has been sitting there for a long time and they can taste it. Um, technology is everywhere, uh, especially for millennials. Uh, this is a very important uh, way of connecting and even in the restaurant, uh, looking up things. Uh, don't be afraid to incorporate an iPad at the table. I think that's that will be the new newest thing um, to actually be able to that the restaurant provides you an iPad at Fleming's. There's iPads in every restaurant now. Um, has information on the wine, on the background, on food pairings, um, and that's definitely the the way it's it's going to go. I think because people are doing it on their own. You can see people in restaurants, and they're not, you know, they're not always looking up. Uh, they're not tweeting or doing anything else. They're actually looking up wines. So I, I think that's going to happen more and more. Uh, as powerful consumers for in, of information and opinions, women are using online tools to help educate and inform their choices. They like to know, they like to make it uh, uh, easy to understand, so they, they look up things. I, I mean, I look up everything. Uh, if I'm not sure of, of something, I look up everything right on the spot, and I'm sure that most women are like that. Um, and they tell others about it. I, I said it before, but that's what women do. They tell others about it. Uh, it's not just a, a fact that you keep to yourself. You you turn right around and you share it with somebody else. Um, use your website and Facebook pages to showcase best picks and what our guests drinking. Uh, much more important again to women, I think what our guests are drinking would be much more important to uh, a woman, I think, than a man uh, because that goes back to men most of the time uh, uh, caring more about ratings and women not as much and um, so they definitely want to know what other women are drinking or other people like them are drinking. Which brings us to what women prefer to drink. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Big red. Yeah, that's a stereotype, isn't it? Um, that we thought they weren't drinking, but they are actually drinking big reds. And they're still, women are still relying on restaurants to have the staple selections like Cabernet, Pinot Noir, and uh, Bordeaux style blends or Bordeaux itself. Um, but they're just as often asking for other varietals. And this is the real difference, I think, too. And I think Jane talked about that before about variety. Um, women are more likely to try different things, especially when it is recommended or to hear other women talk about it. Uh, so therefore, like uh, wines like Tempranillo and Malbecs are, are uh, examples of uh, growing categories that women have a lot to do with. Uh, sales on Malbec were up 50% uh, last year. 
Wow. So a uh, small base, maybe still, although that's not such a small base, um, still a smaller category uh, in total than Cabernet or Chardonnay, but um, certainly growing. Um, in terms of whites, uh, data still support the trend for higher ticket establishment to trend towards uh, expensive Chardonnays. This is certainly true for um, Flemings, but even at Flemings, uh, Chardonnays are, are losing ground a little bit. And Pinot Gris, Sauvignon Blanc, um, Riesling, they're all very much on the rise. Um, sparkling wines as well, very small base again, but certainly uh, trending up, um, making, uh, making it more of a less uh, special occasion drink uh, in restaurants has really helped. I think just um, you know having your server say can I start you off with a sparkling wine I find that very hard to say no to actually uh, I, whenever I've, so yeah I've never been able to say no to that <laughs> no and I don't always often think about it I don't even often think about it uh, but um, but when they say would you like to start off with a sh with a champagne I go like well yeah so <laughs> that's 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 definitely the way to, to, to sell, obviously, to, to recommend it. Um, after years of putting women off with their advertising, a lot of spirit companies are marketing directly to women uh, with products like Skinny Girl Margarita and Adult Chocolate Milk. Uh, both were developed by women. Um, I must say I am not a huge fan of <laughs> Skinny Girl Margarita, but last I heard, uh, Bethany Frankel actually sold that company for a lot of money, so um, I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think we need Skinny Girl Margaritas, but maybe that's just me. It's very popular, popular though. So, uh, the top three wines by the glass, according to Napa, uh, according to their survey, Napa Technologies survey, mine. Mine were a little uh, slightly different at Fleming's, but uh, top three varietals on the rise are Malbec, Pinot Noir, and Champagne. I would definitely add Riesling and Pinot Grigio to that still. Um, three varietals declining in popularity. I, I think Chardonnay is definitely declining, but still a huge share of the business. Uh, Merlot, yeah, I think Merlot is kind of stabilized. It's uh, it stopped its slide, I think. And Cabernet, I have seen nothing like that at Fleming's. But of course, I'm I'm talking about a, uh, a steakhouse. It's actually been rising steadily over over the years and takes up, I mean, takes up about a fifth or a quarter of the business at Fleming's. So. Oh. All right. Uh, tactical takeaways. Um, I'm just going to quickly recap these because we're starting to run long and I want to get to Q&A. And as Karen mentioned, this deck will go out to everybody. Um, but just real quick to reiterate what we talked about today, you know, be wise in your approach to the table. We know women like to taste and you'll have a greater dining experience when you give them the chance to try on new varietals. Um, women are also very much about the story and education. so. Prepare and arm your staff well with good stories about the region, the flavor profile, and pairing suggestions. This makes all the bit of difference when you're engaging in this very dominant population. Also, make well-educated pairing suggestions. It absolutely is what is driving the long-term return. Um, diversify and amplify. As I, we mentioned earlier, wines by the glass offerings are no longer hovering in the eight to 10 range. They are 25 to 30. So have an equal balance of price points, which also gives you some opportunity with your half glass options, as well as some really interesting worldly offerings, maybe even local or organic offerings. But those are the types of things your female guests are going to gravitate toward and be intrigued by. And then again, we, we've talked about it significantly today, but the flight of wine can be very important when marketed properly to this group of highly profitable demographic. Don't just make it any wine flight. Really think about how you're telling the story. And then we talked about the fact that women really work in packs, and this is very favorable to every operator. So all too often, tastings are impromptu or unorganized. 
Women are planners and calendar keepers. Give them plenty of time to put it on their calendar, as well as give them ample time to include their friends whether that's offering discounts on multiple ticket purchases or a free ticket to the person that organizes a group of six or more. Um, you might also want to consider offering discounts on dining for parties of six or more if they stay after the tasting. Um, another opportunity is to create unique takeaways from these events. So it's not just about coming and sampling wine and leaving with a little pad of notes, but something engaging like recipes for pairings or items that go well with that wine, uh, get your chef involved, set up a web page where people can come back to it and tweet or communicate with the chef, things like that, things that really take the story outside of your four walls and make a real impact. Awesome. So, I'm going to turn it back to you, Karen, so you can take some questions. That brings us to our Q&A section. Um, we have a couple of questions that uh, we will it will give you a few minutes. We also um, here is everybody's information. I'm going to do a little something right here. One moment, please. Um, sorry about that. Um, Okay, yes. Okay, so this deck is going to be available after the webinar. Um, we will send it out to everybody. We're going to do the deck as well as the recording. Recording will take about 72 hours. Um, if anybody wants the original research that we pulled together for part of this, I'd be happy to send that out as well. Just shoot me an email and I will send it out. Um, okay, um, from Stephanie, uh, how can I discern individual preferences? Who wants to take that? That might be a good one for, for Marion. Yeah, yeah, discern individual uh, preferences for wines uh, as in what they taste like, right? I, I believe so. Um, is that right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I was a sommelier for years, and uh, so people will ask you questions, but it also means that uh, you would probably have to ask them some questions to figure out, like, what they like. And as a sommelier, we usually start with, what do you usually drink? Because it's such a shorthand for trying to find out something quickly. So if a person says Chardonnay, then you probably ask a brand name or you would want them to um, explain what kind of taste profile it is in. Uh, so do you like oaky Chardonnay or not so oaky Chardonnay? And then um, so you, you just kind of drill down on, on, on what they like. And it's actually not very hard and it's uh, people will quickly give up what they like and what they don't like. and. Um, so that's that's definitely um, you know think like a sommelier, and and ask them some questions. Um, we have this question came in from multiple people, and it's uh, can you provide tips on upselling more expensive wines? I think we talked a little bit about that in terms of uh, providing sampling, but if there's anything anybody wants to add, you know I would like to say something about that. Um, because I think upselling is a dangerous thing. Um, I understand you want to make more money, but you also want to you want to have people be comfortable in their price range. And I would think this is especially important to women who make a lot of decisions based on price as well as taste. Um, so I would be careful to kind of first figure out how much a person would want to spend on it and not upsell them too much. If I come in for a glass of white zin, I don't want you to try to sell me Chateau Lafitte. Right. <laughs> you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, a, a gap there. And so you, you want to be careful with that. That said, I think sampling is a great idea. Yeah. Perfect. I think another opportunity is what we had talked about. And again, it's a tricky proposition without a preservation system, but half-glass offerings. We're seeing that more and more 
so what that gives the discerning consumer that that isn't quite inclined to splurge, they will add that second half glass or third half glass or that, you know, what would be a $30 glass of wine, but they can afford it at 15 to their dessert. It's a very smart way to offer them a variety of shopping options that will also inevitably end, end you up with the upsell experience. And, and one thing I would just say from the marketing standpoint for women is, um, and, and to add, like you said, absolutely, I think the half glass is, is an excellent uh, way to upsell. Um, from an education standpoint is if you're going to, um, you know, to Marion's point, it's not just upselling for the sake of upselling for profit but to make sure that you're armed with the information of why a glass of wine can go from being, you know, 10 to $12 a glass to 30. I think that's the biggest question I get, especially from women, that they really don't understand. And a lot of them ask me, you know, is it just marketing that I'm paying for? You know, what, you know, makes a wine so much more expensive? So I think, you know, the other thing to upsell is to be very educated on that wine. As we all know, uh, limited production, a single vineyard, uh, you know, the terroir, the, um, you know, winemaking uh, process, and also, you know, the farming techniques, those are all very huge factors in what determines what makes a, a wine price. Uh, the way it is. So I think you need to have that information so that you can um, upsell them and let them really enjoy what that wine is going to taste like. Great. Um, we have a question from Stephen. Uh, can you have too many wine options on your list? Well, no. Marion had a hundred. <laughs> 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 I think it's how you do it. Um, again, speaking as the expert on preservation, um, you know, it has been a really interesting journey for us to watch the wines by the glass environment evolve. It is such a dangerous proposition to try to manage a huge wines by the glass program and not be able to temp control it and preserve it properly because then you're offering a subpar experience. So the answer is yes, I think you can manage a lot and have a really beautiful array of variety, but you also have to be a smart operator so that you can manage it and get the same outcome, you know, the, the desirable outcome. Great. Uh, anything to add to that? Marion, obviously you had a hundred wines by the glass. Yeah, I, I think, well, Jane is exactly right. I mean, if you do not have, um, a way to preserve it, which I don't know why you wouldn't if you have, you know, a number of wines by the glass. But um, yeah, if you don't, if you don't have the space or not a way to preserve it, then yeah, you should limit your wines by the glass. Great. Um, we're going to do two more questions um, from uh, Deborah. How do I make my wine program appeal to diversified tastes? Um, when one. you say, is it similar to what Marion answered before about, you know, the profiles and that? Um, I, I think, you know, um, if I understand the question as far as diversified taste is, as you're saying, people um, like all different types of wines. So what we were saying earlier is you should really design a uh, program that fits different flavor profiles. So, yes you should have something sparkling, something that maybe has a little bit more of a sweeter profile to it so that you're, you're not forgetting that, that group of people that are doing it. You could have two different um, Chardonnays, an oak and an un -oak, so you're appealing and you're also educating at the same time. Um, right. So once again, uh, think about the different types of um, the groups that are out there as far as, you know, lighter reds, heavier reds, more full bodied, more jammy fruit forward, and try to pick a selection that will give people an opportunity 
um, depending on what their preferences are. I think Marion can probably add really greatly to this because the Fleming's program is based on intensity profiles. So you really want to have, you know, one or two in each different profile so you're not missing out on anybody. Sure. And Marion, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, and in, in, uh, in addition to that, you also want to make sure that you have those wines in a particular uh, taste profile at different price points. So you're Correct. not uh, cornering people into having to spend a certain amount of money. They can choose. So Pinot Grigio's at seven dollars a glass and twelve dollars a glass, for instance. Great. Okay, um, we have time for one more question here. Um, the question is: Are you seeing? Uh, she asked about nine ounce pours as yeah. becoming more popular. Um, yeah, it's called a quartino or, or okay. an, a glass and a half or a big pour. Everybody has different terms for that. Very pop getting to be very popular. Great. And then and then in terms obviously we're also seeing a lot a huge surge in the two ounce pour, the one ounce pour. Is that correct? Yeah, I I think all sizes. I I, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know if anybody does it yet but to just sell wine by the ounce okay I guess you do with the Napa Tech machines in a way um, Jane I think when you're when you're delving into that super premium is where we're seeing it happen by the ounce you know we have a partner in New York Boulet Bistro they are serving you know Petrus at I think it's $32 an ounce so when you have those really beautiful brands that people will savor or want to only explore by the ounce because they can't afford a whole glass. Uh, the Staples Center, oddly enough, in Los Angeles, although maybe not oddly enough at all because it's L.A., but they serve Screaming Eagle out of their wine station by the ounce. Great. So I think in your super premium brands, the ounce still has some real relevance. Perfect. Well, that is mm -hmm. that wraps it up. Um, I will send the deck out to everyone and then we'll send a link out in the next 72 hours or so with uh, the deck as well as the recording. And again, um, here's everyone's information. And if you have a question A that maybe we didn't answer, I'm going to try and get back to you on that. Or if you come up with more questions, feel free to shoot them off to anybody and we will uh, we'll get back to you as, as best we can. So thank you, everybody, for participating. And um, it was fantastic. It was a big webinar today. So uh, thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.